Right, uh, good evening, everybody. It's Ken. Uh, it is August 5th, and this is the uh, uh, weekend uh, webinar for swing and day trading. Um, there were no questions on the swing trading board, so I'm going to go right into the day trading board. Uh, I'm going to be sharing some ideas and insights that came from this last uh, week of live trading at uh, at the live trading workshop, and uh, and I've hit some I've added some highlights to this FAQ and to the lessons. Uh, so I think there's quite a lot of value there uh, that we just added. So I appreciate your patience. We just couldn't get a uh, um, a webinar done last week. We were too deep into the uh, research weekend. All right, so uh, these are mostly Peter's questions, and so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, question number three. Uh, I'm going to come back, Peter, to the uh, frog entry rules uh, a little more detail. I want to knock out some of these other ones first. Okay, so question number three. Uh, can I explain the lazy W pattern? Is it simply a pullback? How is it different from a pocket? So a lazy W simply looks like you have a price that does this. And it is a series of rising lows and higher highs. And that creates, that creates the W. So it's one, two, three, four. You've made a higher low and you're making higher highs. So that's a lazy W. Uh, that can happen anywhere. Now, what makes it different than a pocket? So the lazy W you, you can find in any uh, discussion of technical analysis. Right? So what we're calling a pocket has a very specific meaning. And the pocket that we're referring to is um, that you have you have a dragon pattern that looks like this. So the dragon is formed by the 10 period Bollinger Band plus or minus 0 0.5 and you have a RL10 that has done this that has cut below the dragon so you have an RLXD right here regression line crossing the dragon and has come down a certain distance and now is crossing up above the uh, above the dragon All right. so in this construction uh, if we just drew a a resistance line at the top hump of the dragon we take that to be the real resistance level, the statistically significant resistance. Now remember that the, the dragon uh, is formed by a, a Bollinger Band of uh, 10 periods plus or minus one. And so that means that um, there's going to be some prices, you know, these are the candles that went up there, be some prices that went higher than the hump of the dragon. Uh, but we, we take these to be noise because there's not enough of it to uh, be statistically significant. So it's the hump of the dragon creates the new resistance. Now, if uh, we take the RL10 to be the actual smooth price, when the RL10 crosses through that resistance level, formed by the hump of the dragon, we call that the emerging dragon, the ED, emerging dragon. And we take that to be a signal that resistance has been broken and off that thing goes. It's not unusual for this to be a, uh, an explosive move, okay, big explosion, boom. And that's when price comes through here uh, and it hits all the stop orders of everybody that was short. Everybody that was short here, we think, 
uh, had had their stop orders up here um, just above fair value or, or just above the uh, swing high I should say Oops. Uh, so all this, uh, there's an explosive move up in here. When this price goes through, uh, it's not unusual to see that thing just explode and go. And so we don't want to try to be catching that as you get range expansion. expansion. You don't want to chase the breakout move. So if this area above the resistance line formed by the hump of the dragon, if the area above this is explosive, then the area in between here, that where I'm drawing the circle now, this is what we call the pocket, and that is a period of relative or an area of relative calm, uh, where this thing has had an upward move, it has pulled back, and then has reversed. And we say that reversal is confirmed by the RL10 passing through the dragon and doing an RLXT. So there's this little area of quietude where it is recrossed above the dragon, but has not yet breached resistance. It is normal for this to be a little more hesitant as price approaches resistance. It's in this area that we're able to get a good fill and that we can position ourselves in anticipation of a move through resistance. If it works, then when price goes through resistance and explodes, Instead of trying to chase it to get a fill, uh, what we're doing is moving our our uh, our protective stop, which was below the the belly of the dragon. So if we were able to enter in here, and we have our stop below the belly of the dragon, uh, when that price moves up through resistance, our job is simply to get our our stop into the money and above that previous resistance, thus locking in uh, no lose plus dinner for two. So when we say a pocket, it has this very precise meaning. It's that space between the resistance formed by the hump of the dragon and the resistance formed by the, or the support formed by the belly of the dragon. This is the area of a pocket. Now where you see that is, is quite often on like a hybrid frog that goes into a P1 and then an owl entry. When that owl entry occurs and he makes a gain and then he pulls back and then makes another and then recovers, this is the area where that pocket forms. And it's not unusual to see two pockets after a successful owl. And that creates a three-legged trade. Leg one is the original leg caused by the owl. Leg two is a leg that's formed by uh, the successful pocket. And then leg three is, um, is that next successful pocket when that happens. Now, what happens is if you get all three of those legs on, a, on the next higher time frame, this looks like their first leg has been set in. Now, if the, if the move before that was a big, strong move down, and your little uh, three-legged entry here was all successful. Everybody who's invested in this big downward move now sees this as a pocket to get short on the collapsing dragon. So the collapsing dragon works the same way. You find the belly of the dragon, and then if price breaks through that, this is where the explosive move move occurs is after the breach of that support level. So the pocket is created by this little this little hump, this little retracement that you put in. Uh, you're you're going to ask me later uh, there's another question here later from Peter that says um, should we wait for the one and the three minute signals to all to get long in here? Uh, my observation is this. If you're if the first move was down and then on the three minute chart and then on the one minute chart, you see an owl and you get a successful trade in here. As soon as this thing gets to be significant, people are from the three minutes are looking to crush this and get short. So the chances that you see both the one and the three minute in agreement is pretty small. I think two, 
two-thirds of the time or three-quarters of the time, that move is going to get hammered. And what that means is is that you, you can't fall in love with your owl and your two little pockets. When you make those, those gains, you've got to be ready to just grab what you can get and get paid because chances are the next move is, is the stronger one. And now you can actually play that as a collapsing dragon or on a three minutes, that would be a failed owl. And then it becomes a collapsing dragon when it breaks through resistance. Now, if you want to front run that move, again, you're looking to buy in the pocket created by created by that little Lee uh, before it breaks down below uh, support. Okay? So, Lazy W, then, is just any formation that looks like uh, rising lows in a channel of higher highs and higher lows. And that creates the Lazy W. The pocket has a very precise meaning in the way that we use it in our style of trading. Okay? Uh, question number four. In many of my examples, I use 0.3 for the initial stop. Why this number specifically? Uh, because that number on most of my targets has become the minimum manageable risk box. Most of the things that I trade are somewhere between 30 bucks and $100 per share. And I'm able to uh, manage 30 cents of risk on it without taking uh, more than that. I, I find that to be manageable. Uh, so in the case of like an owl, if it starts moving up off the bottom and it moves 30 cents uh, off that the belly of the dragon, I'm usually ready to get in right there at a 30 cent move off the bottom of that of that swing low. I would like to see some confirmation of that, like like there was a dragon, and and I'm getting it in the pocket. I would like to see that, but it just turns out that that 30 cents has been a manageable number for me uh, on most of the things that I trade. Okay, question number five. What do the blue, green, and black dots on the daily report market health check represent? Uh, and those are nothing more than the endpoints of the regression lines on the chart so I can get a quick look at their relationship. Let me see if I can call that up real quick. Okay, here's one now. Uh, and so uh, I took the uh, I took the green dots off. I, I found it was getting a little too, um, just a little too cluttered. Uh, I tried looking at that for a while, but I thought it was making the chart a little cluttered. Okay, so. Uh, so the the black big black dots referred to is first there's this one that's at 30 days of look back and that's uh, here is the regression line over the last 30 days this little extra piece uh, is if you if you just extended that to the right uh, five days what's the glide path of that regression line. So if price were to stay in the same, in the same direction and the same strength, no change, uh, where would it be in five days? That's what the big black dot looks like. And then the blue dot is simply 10 days back looking at the 10 period regression line. Uh, for a while I was messing with a 90, uh, but it was getting too close, it was getting too, um, 
too cluttered. So that, that's all that is. Uh, and I'm just looking at the relationship now between uh, that 30 and the 90. So if the black dot is above, then I know that the 10 period is, get, is weaker. The 10 period trend is weaker than the 30 period trend. So it's like an, almost like an RLCO in that sense. Okay. Where do I get the market data? Uh, I use IQ Feed. It's a commercial quality, um, industrial strength, very fast, very clean data. Good for both intraday and end of day. Um, some of the other guys are using Norgate because um, uh, they're just like swing trading. That's uh, much less expensive, but every bit as good, uh, adjusted for splits and whatnot. Uh, so Norgate is a good source of data for end of day. Uh, question seven was uh, some details about RLCO pattern one. Uh, I I just want to tell you the uh, in the last probably year, um, because of the second generation uh, of RLCO, and that's things like um, the collapsing dragon. Um, the Emerging Dragon, the Owl, the P1 Failure, P1F, uh, the Z3 Pinch, and that's both both the Breakout and the um, uh, the the, uh, the channeling version of that, the Z3P breakout and then reversion to the channel and then the super pinch all of these and really the, the hybrid frog that leads to uh, the owl and the P1F uh, and all of these are better than a straight P1 entry and so I much prefer the owl uh, to the P1 entry and I would recommend that you guys do the same. Uh, P1 simply fails too many times, and it's for the reasons that I described earlier. If you have this large move down, the longer and stronger that that move is, the more people that there are that are invested in that move. And if you're a tactical trader, like one minute, three minute, five minute, uh, and you get a little P1 re reversion and you get in here, as soon as this trade starts working, the guys on the next higher time frames all see this as a oh, a chance to to hammer that and to get short on the rebound and get the second leg of their trade. So that's the first leg of their trade. When they hammer you, they're getting the second leg of their trade. And so they're looking to get these little pocket entries. And so when this trade doesn't work, how do you know that trade works? When it gets back to the BB mean, that's what it takes to be a successful, a successful um, P1 trade. It's got to get from outside the river back to the Bollinger Band mean. So many of these fail, however, that the P1, in my view, is better off. You're better off looking at that as an alert or a description of the market condition, and then wait for that owl to occur because the ones that fail before it even gets to the owl become the ones that you want to play as a collapsing dragon or in the pocket in anticipation of a collapsing dragon. And that way you are in line with the primary direction of the trend of the next higher time frames. So that's what I want to say about these two questions in here. Prefer the owl. Okay. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me come back to the uh, to the to the f frog questions that Peter Peter has. 
Uh, he was asking for some clarifications on this. Uh, and first, let me come back and talk about the, the hybrid frog first, because you did ask about that, and I, I put a, hopefully a better answer in there. Okay, so, um, so on the frog, first of all, there are uh, mechanical frog rules. There's three of them. There's the slow, the quick, and the leapfrog. And these are essentially the same, but they vary based on the time of day or the time of morning in which those mechanical entries can be taken. So the slow frog initiates at the open plus 60 minutes. The quick frog has to wait 30 minutes and the leapfrog can initiate from the opening. Um, now all of these are based on the idea um, excuse me just a all these are based on the idea that there's a um, uh, is that the higher low of the day is usually formed within the first hour. Okay. Let me get my pen here. Okay, so if this is the opening and we were to go forward 60 minutes we have a 90 percent chance of seeing either the high of the day or the low of the day in the first 60 minutes okay uh, so what that what that means then um, Uh, is if we saw a price open here and then 60 minutes in we see price going that way well then we're entitled to look back and say the high of the day so far has a 90 percent chance of being the high of the day by the time of the close and so then our idea in the um, in the slow frog is that If we have a frog quality number of three, then that means that there are actually four frog boxes of potential move inside the average day. Okay, And so if we can take one of those frog boxes and hang it off the high, then if we could get short here, then we could see potentially one, two, or three uh, frog box gains the rest of the day, and it would just be an average range day. So that's the main idea. So the slow frog waits 60 minutes in order to see that kind of a move. And he looks back and says, where was the higher low of the day? And, and what uh, can I, and, and we use the frog box as a difference between signal versus noise. That we say the frog box is the first non-noise move as defined by the volatility of that instrument. So that's the main idea. So that's the slow frog. Now the, um, the quick frog does the same thing, only he says, let's wait 30 minutes, all right? So if the slow frog is waiting 60 minutes, the quick frog says, well, look how much money I, I potentially gave back on this little example provided. Uh, instead of getting in here where I wanted to when that, uh, when that first non-noise move occurred, I don't get in until down here. And so here's the real problem. The real problem with the... Uh, with the slow frog is like in this example 
This thing may have already moved three frog boxes from the high of the day, and now you only have you only have one frog box left, and now you don't have the justifiable move anymore. There's there's not two units of reward to one unit of risk. And so if this thing has moved more than two frog boxes in a direction away from the high or the low, then you can't take that trade in the slow frog because uh, there's no uh, reasonable reward left the rest of that day. So the way one of the ways we get around that is that we can use the quick frog. And at 30 minutes in, we now have less confidence that we've seen the high or the low of the day. But those opening first five minutes or so of shenanigans has been over, and now we may have actually seen, uh, we may have actually seen that high of the day, and now uh, we can actually take that trade uh, right here. Now to go further, the the leapfrog says uh, we're going to wait zero minutes, and as this as this price starts moving up and down and up and down, as soon as it moves, if it's moving down and it's moved a frog box away from the high of the day, then I can get short wherever that occurs, or maybe in this case right here. Or if it was, if this was the low of the day and it's moving up and it moves a frog box, I can get long right there. So in a nutshell, these mechanical systems, the slow frog, the quick frog, and the leap frog are mechanical uh, ways um, uh, to make those entries. Now, there, there's a problem in there, um, and one of the problems is it requires a lot of work to maintain uh, the levels of entry based on what price action has done that morning, and, and here's what I mean by that, because price doesn't move in a straight line. So here's here's our opening, and and I'm just going to use the slow I'm going to use the slow frog uh, as the example, okay. And here was the opening, and price has moved like this. And here it is, okay. So that's what price looks like right now. Now the big move of the day, and we're going to call this the high of the day. And the, 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 whoops, the big move of the day has been this one. And we're going to say it has moved one frog box off the bottom. So if that's really the high of the day, the big move of the day has a good chance of being down. Ah, but this could also be the low of the day. So right now that's the working high. And that's the working low. And right now at the 60 minute mark, price is actually moving up. So I don't want to get short price when it's moving up because now I'm, I'm buying on, uh, against the trend. And that thing could very easily look like this and that could be that could be the move of the day. It could be three frog boxes up. So at 60 minutes I have to look at what price is doing. If it's moving up and it's moved a frog box or more off the bottom but not more than two frog boxes, then I can get long here and I pick up a trail of one frog box. Okay, But if instead of continuing to go up, this thing now, uh, let's say the, uh, the frog box is not until here, and now price starts to revert, and now it's going down, uh, well, it's already moved one frog box, but not more than two frog boxes, so now I can get short. So the first thing we have to see is what is price doing at 60 minutes? And what we say by price doing something, if I have two bars in the same direction, that's what it's doing. If it's two bars in the other direction, that's what it's doing. So if price is going up, I have to look back and find the low of the day. 
determine if I moved a frog box off the bottom, and it's and if so, and it's going up, but it hasn't moved more than two, then I can get long. Ah, but if if price is going down, and it's moved a frog box off the top, then I can get short and manage my trade accordingly. So there's some judgment that has to be done at 60 minutes in. And the same thing has to be done at 30 minutes in. And so we created the leapfrog, which said, look, right from the opening, uh, if it basically, if it moves a frog box in either direction, then that's going to be the signal to get in. But what we learned was, uh, even in the leapfrog, there's still some management that has to be done in the following way. So from the opening, and we're going to mark that off as one frog box, minus one, and plus one. Okay. So if price moves, but it hasn't moved a full frog box, and then reverses and comes this way, we now say, look, here's the high of the day. And I hang this frog box off the off the high of the day. Uh, technically, I could have gotten short right there. But if the but if the frog box if if the one frog box off the high of the day was here, and then it started to reverse up, I can't get short. But now this becomes the low of the day, and now it only has to move this high off. So when price is making this kind of gyrations from the beginning, you end up having these, this narrowing, uh, this narrowing amount of moves that you have to take, you have to continually monitor. That becomes very difficult to monitor manually uh, in multiple symbols. You you almost can't even do that manually and keep up with it. It's just too hard. Uh, so, so we decided we wanted something that was a um, that right from the opening, it would just put a markation line here and said, "Look, if that if that was the opening right there, um, if it goes above that line, and I'm never going to change it, I'm going to go long. If it goes above this, goes below that one, I'm going to go short. So, no matter how price is moving around in here, I'm never going to adjust those lines. And then if it breaks out, I'm going to buy it, or if it breaks down, I'm going to short it." And so this was this was called the hybrid frog because we were taking uh, a form of that. Now what we said was we also learned that we didn't have to wait for a full frog box in order to take that action. Um, so this is what we learned. And we covered this one in the uh, live trading workshop as well. And this one's pretty important. And this has to do with understanding uh, your histogram um, and then doing some engineering. So here's what we learned. We learned from guys that were trading this, uh, the uh, leapfrog and the quick frog mechanically. This is uh, over almost a thousand trades. Here's what we learned. Um, that the that the win rate was something like 54 percent and the average win was 0. 0.6 and um, the average loss was 0. 0.4 minus 0. 0.4 so a 46 percent all right so this when we looked at this it was like 56 or 54 against 46 it's a slightly favorable coin but which paid it essentially paid three to two okay now according to those rules we said now how did you get an average trade well the the frog would move off the bottom and it would move 1.0 all right so we're going to call it 1.0 and then it was trailing with a frog box. 
and off, off that would go. And, uh, and so this thing would just continue to go until it pulled back and, and pulled a minus one, a, a one frog box off the top. And then that's where it would, that's where it would strike. And if the average win was 0 0.6, then what that meant was, if it got in at, 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 uh, at, let's call that the zero line, it would have had to move plus 1.6 frog boxes and then pull back a full minus one in order to leave you with 0.6. And we looked at that and said, look, we're, we're only keeping 0.6 of a move that went 1.6 in our favor. So we didn't like the way the trailing stop was working. What we said was that after an average win, somehow we ought to be fighting to capture more of this minus one instead of giving a full frog box back. But that was crucial. The second thing that we learned was that when we looked at the, at the losing trades that got to minus four, to get a minus 0.4, that, that thing, it meant that from the opening, you had to at least get to a 0.6, the average win, and come back in order to get the average loss of minus 0.4. And we said, well, that's really crappy. I should not, I, psychologically, I don't like to have an average win in hand, which I'm happy about, because it pays three to two. It feels terrible to have an average win in hand and then somehow let that become a negative trade. So we said no matter what, by the time we get to an average win, our stop should be accelerated so that we don't lose money on that and maybe no lose plus dinner for two. So that became crucial. Now here's the third thing that we studied. We said of all the, of all the trades that paid off 0.6, of all our wins, how many of them from the moment we bought them went down almost to minus one? So if that's minus one, how many of them sold off sharply and then reversed and then came up to give us our average win? And it turned out none of them did. And what that means is that the frog trade, when it works, works quickly. And so when it works quickly and gets past like about 0.3, on the way to 0.6, your stop ought to be above zero right around there so that you don't let that become a losing trade. Not later than the time it crosses that 0.6 in your favor, um, it, should be, it should be your money. You should not let that go negative. Now here's the next thing that we said. If this was the low of the day, Instead of waiting for a 1.0 frog box move off the bottom to get in, what if we just entered at 0.7? And then when it crossed the 1.0 frog box, where we were happy to get in before, and we were happy to get in before because it was a it had a positive expectancy system. So we said, what happens if we enter at 0.7? Now when we enter, and now instead of uh, entering at 1.0, we're actually plus 0.3. And what we discovered was that by waiting just 0.7, you, didn't ex you still didn't experience a reversal of 0.7 and then turn around to go on to victory. So we discovered that by simply by entering at 0.7 and then trailing with 0.7 that we were very happy. And now those average trades that were getting us 0.6 are now getting us 0.9 just with that little refinement. And to go from 0.6 to 0.9 on the capture is plus 50% of returns. So out of all this analysis, the hybrid frog evolved. And here's what that little guy looks like now.
So in the hybrid frog, all we do is right from the open, we put a 0.7 box and straddle the open. And then if price, uh, and then we make we make that uh, we make that last you know basically forever. So we never adjust that. And as soon as price you know can do whatever it wants, as soon as it breaks out of here, we're long. And then we pick up a trail of 0.7 and trail it. And we look to accelerate that manually if we can. Or if it breaks down below the red line, then we're short. And again, we're trailing with 0.7 or as soon as we can get to no lose plus dinner for two. And that becomes the hybrid frog. Now this leads into the chain trading that you will see uh, some really good flashcards on. And which we did a lot of this past week. A lot of and so the chain trading just while we're here combines this hybrid frog idea whichever way that's going to go if it leaves the high if it leaves that hybrid frog box right and then is is successful and it moves another 0.7 from the open, what that really means is that it, it just moved 1.4 frog boxes. And if we said 1.0 frog box, a frog box 1.0 is the definition of a non-noise move, then we're going to say a successful hybrid frog, which is the 0.7 that it moved to get the entry, plus the 0.7 that it moved to get the win, equals 1.4, we're going to call that, by definition, the unambiguous move. And maybe it goes further. I'm going to draw it further so we can see. What, and now, when, once that thing starts to reverse, and uh, what we have is, all, is uh, we have an unambiguous move. Somewhere in here, you're going to see a, a P1 outside the river. That's two. You're going to see... Uh, the dragon will have come down and you're going to see the RL10 crossing the dragon creating the RLXT and that's three and then the next thing you'll see pretty shortly after that is the dragon rolls up and that's four uh, and then the, uh, the RL30 will roll up and that's five and that creates the conditions of an owl. All right? So that's part of the hybrid frog chain. It goes from the hybrid frog down into an owl. But if the owl fails, it becomes a P1F, which is actually the trade that I want. Because whatever this whatever this move was that got us down here the unambiguous move if the owl works that's great and now you have like a morning hook and off it goes but if that doesn't work what you're going to get is this you're going to get this pattern up an owl that fails and down and now you know that we call this the collapsing dragon when it breaks below in here and your job is to get short in this pocket if you can but if you can't, to get short at the collapse, not later than the collapsing dragon, and then the size of this move is going to be the size of the second move, and hopefully the size of the third move. And if you see that whole thing, then that is going to be the first leg of two time frame higher, and then they could really pile into this thing. So. That's what we mean by the chain trading you will see in the uh, day trading course. Um, many detailed examples of that one. But that's my basic battle drill in the morning. I start off with uh, all the frog champions set up for hybrid frogs. And there's three things that I do. I have frog champions. 
the usual suspects. That's like all the big fat indexes that I trade every day. Uh, I have any continuation patterns. So if there was something that was in play yesterday and I was able to trade it and it's going to be still in play today, then I'm always ready to hybrid frog and chain trade that one. And then the fourth thing is if there's any new signals, like new swing signals uh, that suggest that today might be day one of a nice swing move. Those four pools of symbols become the way that I build my uh, my radar screen for getting started in the morning. And uh, I'm going to show you here in a second on the uh, day trading and the swing trading course where you can see some videos of us doing that relentlessly this past week. I mean, we were getting 20 trades in the first hour and the win rate was about 0.6. 0.2 scratches, 0.2 losses, and the payoff was 2 to 1. So, in my view, that's what you do. That's how, to me, using our strategies and, and systems, that's what you do. Hybrid frog on those four pools of candidates uh, into the owl or P1 failure as a chain trade. And then the final thing is that the rest of the day, the final piece of this chain trade is that if this thing was successful and the owl worked, it goes up as far as it's going to go and then it mucks around sideways and then it gets into this, the, the Bollinger Band lines pinch and then you can put a, and then when it's less than a frog box, you now have the Z3 pinch. And you trade that like a breakout or if the, it was a really big losing trade eventually that'll go as far as it can go until it stops and then that will wiggle around sideways and then the z3 lines will collapse in here until they're less than a frog box and then you also have a z3 pinch so you have uh, you have the hybrid frog right from the opening then you get some of these directional trades with the owl patterns and the collapsing dragons. And then eventually these things settle down sometime during the day and they become a Z3 pinch. And it was either after a nice move up or a nice move down. You say, well, Ken, what happens in the third case if right from the open you never get an owl and all it does right from the open is this sideways quite Well, exactly the same thing. Failure to move will collapse into a Z3 pinch. Oops. It'll collapse into a Z3 pinch. And you're going to get a Z3 pinch on the basis of no movement from the open. So one of those three pathways is how you end up getting to a Z3 pinch somewhere. And then if all the four regression lines, the 10, 30, 90, and 270, all fit within that same then you have a super pinch and that's the best pattern of all so while you're waiting for the Z3 super pinch uh, that gives you a playbook right there of four or five things that you can do uh, each and every day um, so yeah so that's what I that's what I want to cover there. Let me come back to your uh, to your discussion, Peter. Uh, let me finish the rest of the questions first, because I want that to sink in. Uh, what we just talked about there. So I now want to uh, come back to Peter's question, and that is, what are the rules? And definitions of the hybrid frog okay so I just covered the slow quick and leap frog and and how we get to the hybrid frog because of our new understandings uh, we have developed the hybrid frog it has the following rules number one bracket the open with a fraction of the frog box my default position right now is 0.7 
don't vary the price where you go long and short. So in other words, keep those in position. Go long or short based on the direction of the breakout of that bracket, and then use that hybrid frog box as your trailing stop. Get to no lose plus dinner for two as soon as you can. And then use the same exit and reversal rules as you do for the mechanical frogs. There's, I'm, in, the, uh, in the live trading workshop, I covered a technique called the opening range five, opening bar five. Uh, I'm going to, I really like the way I gave that speech in the live trading workshop, so I'm going to hang that uh, in the swing course and in the day trading course. I'm not going to try to cover it right now. You guys get a lot on your plate. But it's a it's one more refinement to the um, to the opening. You basic you can get a little bit whipsawed with the hybrid frog. The OR five, you wait five minutes and you find the high and low of that box, and you use that as if it were a hybrid frog, and that turned out to be pretty powerful. Uh, but I want you to see the uh, the actual video that I made on that one. Okay. Hey, there's some more things I want to cover. Shift fingers. Uh, this one's essential. Uh, question two. What's the difference between the execution R and the position sizing R? And, and this is what I told the guys at the workshop. I said that this lesson is the most important psychological lesson that I've learned in 30 years of day trading. It's the single most important psychological lesson that I've learned in 30 years. And I trade this way, and what I told them was, uh, I am willing to listen to other people's advice on how to adjust my trading, and I'm willing to listen to new ideas. Except this one, that there is no force that I know of that can make me change the way that I use these two concepts, execution R and position sizing R. It's that important, okay? Uh, so the first piece, let me just read it to you. Execution R is the price on the particular specific trade that you're working that invalidates the hypothesis of the directional trade. It's the price that tells you this idea is wrong. Let me show you what I mean. Now this can be um, either day trading or swing trading. It, it does not matter. Okay. Works the same way. So here's, we're going to cover day trading on this side and swing trading on this side. So let's say uh, that the, the, uh, that's the opening, and that was the close yesterday. And so now it opened here. And let's, so that we have this little gap. We have this little gap right here. And we're going to say that the, uh, this rascal sold off quickly and then started to reverse. And that looks like what we would call a morning hook. Now, what we're really interested in is if this thing went a fail stat, which we defined as the average loss from the open to the low of the day, uh, if that was the average, ah, God dang it, sorry. If that was a fail stat, and we saw this little gizmo going, uh, we might say we might have the following position. The soonest I'll get into that is like a one, two, three entry, or I might take a hybrid frog. I'm just going to call that an H, 
or I might wait for a full frog box off the bottom. I might also do uh, something like uh, something like a uh, the RLXD or the owl. So there's about ten different patterns maybe that might cause me to get in on that particular idea. In all of them, the price that tells me that this idea has failed is my execution risk, you know, below the swing low. And any price down in this region tells me that my hypothesis that this thing is going to go do a uh, a range stat move to the upside. This price down here at X, as soon as it breaks through this red line, my execution risk, that tells me that this idea is wrong. Now, some people will tell you that if you are, are risking $400 a trade, and let's say that I was using an aggressive 1, 2, 3, stop, a one, two, three entry, and maybe that was only 20 cents. Some people would say, oh, well, Ken, that leads you to, you could have a position size of 2,000, 2,000 shares because you want to risk $400 per trade and your execution stop is only 20 cents. Hey, but what if my, what if my average slippage was 10 cents and that worked against me? And what if I got double my average slippage and it worked 20 cents. Uh, if I waited 20 cents uh, and then this was an explosive move down and I got a 20 cent or worse fill, I now have a minus 2R loss and it's on the biggest position that I could possibly have. Whereas if this was a, a frog box of 1.0, maybe it was $1 and I was risking 400 shares and it moved a full frog box against me and I took that as my exit I have a 1 hour loss but it's only on 400 shares and not on 2,000 shares so I don't like the variation first of all I don't like taking any losses bigger than 1 hour I don't even like taking a 1 hour loss and I don't like having to compute all of these different position size intraday all of which are simply based on what the price action on this trade happens to be and which particular entry technique that I'm using. There's too much variation in there. So here's what I say. For me, the frog box on the intraday, the frog box is the definition of signal versus noise. That's the widest stop that I'm going to have for execution during the day. So if any of my other techniques can't get me in on this move to the top side, I know that I just have to hold my nose and buy it because it's a frog box off the bottom, and then my execution risk equals my position sizing risk. But if I do that, I do not like to take a full one hour loss. Well, why is that? You will remember on the last briefing I gave you, I said on those on those frog trades where we entered and then it immediately started selling off, if it ever went past minus 0.7, it never turned around and became a winning frog trade. So that tells you right away that I can cut this thing at 0.7. I don't have to take that extra minus 0.3. And now what I've done is I have improved my exit. I've improved my trade result by minus 0.3. So here's how I use that uh, routinely. So on the day trade, I use a frog box as my position sizing risk. And then my job is to try to get a better entry and what I and then use this the the entry this is my execution risk right here whatever that swing low was whatever that price is it's going to get me out of that long side trade. that's
That's going to be my execution risk. What I like to see is about one-third. I'd like my execution risk to be up about one-third of my position sizing risk. So if I get a one, two, three entry and it fails, and I take that full loss here of execution, it really counts as a minus 0.3. Now psychologically, that's really powerful for me. Because in my mindset, as soon as I put the position sizing trade on with the frog box as my position sizing, I already count that as a minus one loss. In my mind, I, I experience the worst possible thing right away and I just get it over with. And I say, well, that's money that I threw away. That's a one hour loss. And then if I only take a 0.3 loss, it feels like a 0.7 win because they couldn't get me for a full one hour loss. I was able to avoid 0.7 of that. And that psychology actually helps me be resilient when it comes to maintaining my emotional bank account to continue to trade all day. The other thing is, is that the point th when I, if I'm taking a 0 0.3 loss and I'm getting 0 0.6 wins, those each one of those trades doesn't feel like much, so there's not a lot of stress on that. But you'll notice that I'm getting paid two to one. I am letting my winners run, and I'm cutting my losers short. And because there's very little psychological cost to me to trade that way, I can take a lot of trades. I can take 30 or 40 trades during the day, and it doesn't drain my emotional bank account. So there's three things that go into in, into this. There's uh, there's the execution risk. There's the position sizing risk, and then there's the dollars per trade that I'm willing to risk as a percentage of portfolio. So it takes all three of these things to determine the trade architecture or the trade geometry, if you will. All right. So here's what I'll tell you. When you get proficient trading in this way, don't ever change your position sizing risk and your execution risk because you will have accumulated a lot of trades that have given you familiarity with trading in that style. And the number that you change is this one, the dollars per trade at risk. As you become successful, even if you just keep the percentage of portfolio constant, that's going to increase the dollars per trade at risk without ever changing the trade geometry that helped you become successful. I know guys, some guys who would say, well, if I'm very comfortable trading in this way, I can, I can reduce the frog box to half a frog box for my position sizing risk. And I would tell you, you have no evidence that that actually works until you actually do that. I said, go ahead and keep all of your successful trade architecture the same and then simply change the dollars at risk per trade. So make it go from 400 per trade to 500 per trade. Uh, go to 500 for 600 or simply percentage of portfolio at risk. Okay. Now, On day trading, I'm using one times the frog box as my position sizing risk. Position sizing risk. On swing trading, I'm using two times ATR two times ATR fourteen. That's sort of a standard number. And the reason for it is these are both uh, both of these um, distances are appropriate as a wide protective capital protective stop for day trading and for swing trading. And if you use those for your position sizing, but you're using tactical execution risk signals, then you're never going to blow up your account. You're going to find yourself taking less than one R losses, and you're going to be able to use statistical process control 
on your portfolio and on your trading results histogram in order to have confidence in the style that you're trading. You will be able to trade a lot more comfortably and calmly uh, by doing that. Okay? So I will tell you that that is the most important psychological lesson that I have ever learned about trading. And no amount of reasoning about doing it a different way could possibly gain any traction with me. That's one of those things uh, that I am going to go to my grave as a core belief. That for me, that actually works. So I invite you to think about that. Okay? Question three. In many of my videos, I have frog boxes plotted on the TC2000 charts. Are these programmatic or manual? Uh, in TC2000, they are programmatic. I, I'm, I'm sorry, they are manual. In other systems, they are programmatic. You can do it in TradeStation. Uh, I know, and I know Ninja can do it. And, you know, for all I know, TC2000 could do it too. I don't mind drawing the boxes. I kind of enjoy it. Um, okay, so the last general question. Uh, for it to be considered a valid P1F, is it necessary to have a big unambiguous move prior to the P1 pa uh, failure? First, let me say this one. Um, there's an extra word in that one. If it's unambiguous, then it's big enough. So I don't see a big unambiguous move. I see that as redundant. I'm not trying to be a prick on that. I'm just saying that, um, I, I want you to know what I mean by unambiguous. And, I, and I'm and i defining that as 1.4 frog boxes or a 2 ATR move for swing trading. Okay? So for a valid P1F, the it's a good question. Is it necessary to have that unambiguous move prior? So here's how I would, here's how I describe that. Uh, a P1 occurs when the two regression lines cross outside of the river. For that to occur, by definition, the RL30 must be outside of the river. So what will typically happen is, you have some kind of sideways move in here. Everything's all chunked up together. Uh, and then you will have uh, price. Price departs the river. And that's followed shortly by that blue RL10. Because that's so adaptive, it all mathematically, it has to happen pretty fast. Uh, the next thing that happens is that that RL30, wherever it was in the middle of this river, in this mess, when it leaves the river and starts cruising down, um, that moment where the RL30 has now left the river, three things have just occurred. Price, the RL10, and the RL30 by this time, at this moment, all three of those have left the river. That is the beginning of trending behavior. That's the beginning of trending behavior. So that means um, everything after this is a directional trend. So that's going to happen until, and that's going to continue, until the P1 occurs. Out, and so by definition, that P1 happens outside of the river. Because this, because this was a, a, uh, the beginning of trending behavior, it's almost impossible for this not to be 1.4 frog boxes or two ATRs on the swing. So you're always going to see this as an unambiguous move. And so that P1, because it happens outside the river, is automatically significant. Okay? It's automatically significant. 
so now we have the condition where uh, you had the RL10 did this, it gave you a P1, and then it starts to fail again. And again, this is my all-time favorite pattern. When that RL10 is the real price, this is the collapsing dragon here, and that is the pocket. And then this was the Bollinger Band mean at the at the middle of the river. So this was the. Um, So this was that river. So a for this P1, we're going to call that the 30. If that was the P1, for that to be successful, the RL10 had to get across the Bollinger Band mean. Any failure short of the Bollinger Band mean by the RL10, and we're going to call this P1, a failure. Yeah, Jake, go ahead and uh, type in type in the questions here. Uh, so, the short answer is that by definition, a P1 failure mathematically had to have seen a statistically significant move. But I want to put that in the context of how these concepts are uh, created and drawn together, if you will. Because there's a P1, that becomes a significant move. That means that a move back to the Bollinger Band mean is tradable. And if it goes to the far side of the river and beyond, that's going to be a great trade. But if it fails and then gives us the same size move that happened just prior to the P1, then that's going to be a great move. The importance of this trending move down here to the P1 says that this symbol is in play that for that for that moment or for that period of time the bears had enough power to win the fight decisively and take it that far that means they either want to keep going with it or they have woken up the bulls who now want to see that as a buy on dip opportunity and want to fight to take it back what you have is the opposite of the sideways choppy shit inside the river right in the in the sideways crocodile river what you had was game on. They moved it far, and now it's either going to reverse sharply or it's going to fail sharply. But that P1 tells you that this symbol is now in play and that you have a trade. Okay? That's what I want to say about that. Uh, let's see. Now I think someone, Jake, was going to ask a question here. Uh, let me go backwards here. You, uh, I don't look at volume. Can I brief, re, briefly explain why it doesn't interest me? Uh, and there are a lot of people who do use volume. And I don't, I don't say they're wrong. I just don't find it to be of any use to me in the way that I trade. And the reason for that is, is that I concentrate my trading uh, on the very largest large caps and the biggest ETFs. And there's always enough volume and liquidity in there for me to be able to do my thing. And extra volume is not really a signal. I will say, however, that I do look at volume at price. Volume at price I do consider. I don't speak a lot about it, but volume at price does seem useful to me. And the way to look at that, in my view, is through the market profile. And you'll see a lot written about the market profile. I haven't written about it because I use it in a very primitive way. All right. So the market profile is nothing more than uh, it, it takes a look at the volume of a given day and says uh, 
if that was the high and this was the low of the day, the mathematical average of that is called the VWAP, the vol uh, volume weighted at price. Uh, that's the average. That's the mathematical average price based on volume. And what you'll see is that often looks like a a, a, a histogram on its side. And what you'll see is that um, most of the volume was traded right here around the mathematical weighted average. And that out here, near the high of the day and the low of the day, where it reversed sharply, was actually very thinly traded. So that means most everybody was trading between plus or minus one standard deviation. What I really wish I could get was a candlestick that gave me the plus or minus one standard deviation around the average and treated that like the real body. Now, what that means is when I'm swing trading is that yesterday's high and low of the day represents an area where, hey, they couldn't get anything above this or below that. And so if price breaks through, then suddenly it's uncharted territory and it's off to the races discovering who's going to win, bulls or bears. It's, it's um, price discovery. But if, if during the day price gets up near the high of the day and starts to reverse, there's a trade that goes back towards the volume weighted average price. And that becomes the direction you can trade. What you'll often see intraday is something like that. If you put uh, volume at price on the left to, on the vertical axis, you'll often see something like this. Um, you'll see that the high of the day gets pushed up here. You'll see a bunch of uh, volume being traded around in here. And then suddenly they run the price up in a big spike up in here and then it can't get any further and you have a bunch of volume being transacted here and almost nothing in here. And when that collapses and starts coming back, you'll see that them you'll see them starting to fill in all of this with volume. And then at the end of the day, it'll look like this histogram once more. Well, when you read the uh, the market profile literature, what they'll say is uh, if today opens outside of yesterday's range, but then comes back into today's uh, yesterday's range, then it's going to go try to find that point of control or the volume weighted average price from yesterday. But that if it rejects it at the edge, it's going to be that kind of a move. And then intraday, you can use you can use these uh, this price this volume at price information to figure out where the support and resistance levels are. So I would and just encourage you to read the market profile. There's a ton of that stuff available. Um, I, other than that, volume doesn't mean anything to me because I'm trading such liquid instruments. I just that's one less variable I have to contend with, and I found that by restricting my information intake to just the essentials, that I have become a better trader. At your mileage may vary. But that's my position on it, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, the other question was on the alpha stat. So let me cover the idea behind the alpha stat. I'm going to give you the, the concept, but it's really an advanced technique, and it's something that I have in uh, the Trade Station Bundle 2 uh, because it's a, uh, a really powerful idea. It's much more advanced than... Um, I think some of the support and resistance things are that I that I use, um, but it's a it's a it's an idea that is very adaptive and um, is very useful on swing trading, especially. Uh, so let me describe that here in a second. Let's see, where's the drawing? Is I'm going to give you the quick quick and dirty explanation of it. And uh, Peter, let me know in, a, in an email if I haven't answered your questions or if you need more. Sorry. Okay, the alpha stat real quick.
so alpha means the difference between a symbol and the market that it's a part of. So let's, I'm just going to use two, two symbols. So SPY is the market, and the Russell 2000 is I, IWM, and that's a, a trading, um, uh, the trader's choice for a very liquid yet broad-based uh, symbol. It has a lot of volume. And those things tend to be strongly correlated, usually somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9 correlation, mean, meaning very strong correlation, 0.7, or damn near identical, 0.9. Okay? So alpha, or like a little fish, if I remember, I think that's alpha. Alpha is the difference between IWM and SPY. So when they're 0 0.7 correlated, if that's the gains of SPY, and IWM maybe is more in favor, this little piece in here is the alpha, that this is beta. Beta is that portion of a symbol's returns that can be attributed to the market. The stronger the correlation, the less alpha there is. Now sometimes that alpha is negative alpha. Like it could be, it could have been an underperformance of, of that much, okay? But alpha is what's unique to that particular symbol. So if you have a company like Microsoft, and he's part of a sector and that sector is part of the market, we know that 50% of his return comes from the market, 25% from the sector, and only 25% comes from Microsoft itself. So the, this 25 is the Microsoft Alpha, and this 25 is the technology sector's Alpha compared to the market. All right. So let's take a uh, let's take a look at the S and P something like this whatever, and we were to draw a regression line, and say, you know that let's call it the thirty. That regression line has a slope. That angle has some slope, and we're going to say that's the that's the gains uh, that the S and P made. Now, if at some point, uh, the Russell 2000 was better, sorry, I'm trying to draw that as red, ah. oh, I know, I think I'm in the wrong one, yeah, so if that sucker was if this was the uh, the Russell small cap, we would say that the difference uh, between those two was alpha. All right. So when we know that the correlation between these two guys uh, changes over time, that the uh, the S and P does this, it goes up and goes down, and that the uh, the Russell strongly correlated often goes like this. And so this little extra juice on both sides of that is his alpha. Right? So the main idea behind this is twofold. First of all, we can, if we were if we were trading um, the Russell, we might say if this was the zero line, we might go back. Oh, I don't know, five thousand days, and say what was the steepest. 30 period regression line that it ever had and what was the worst 30 that it ever had right and what was the long term average 
and then we started and then for each one of those if it was 5,000 days there would be 4,970 sets of 30 day regression lines and so we start plotting that out what you would find is it looks sort of like this like some kind of like some kind of histogram and then if you put a plus one and a minus one standard deviation on it whenever that slope whenever that slope of uh, the Russell gets higher than plus one SD ah then this becomes an exceptionally good return this really becomes excess gains you weren't really entitled to believe that this is now officially an exceptional move and similarly this thing is exceptionally poor and at some point these excess gains are going to disappear and it's going to run back to the long-term average or these are it's going to stop sucking so bad and it's going to run back to the long-term average so that is using the slope stat of a symbol that looks at his own performance his own performance relative to his performance this is about a million dollar idea by the way it's actually more than that it's probably ten million dollars if you do it right so now we can compare IWM with SPY and we can say when the S&P is here on his slope stat and IWM is here on his slope stat what's the difference between those two and we can express that as a percentage how much better or worse is the Russell compared to the S&P and then we can also we now we can take that relationship and go back 5,000 days and simply by be care, by comparing the slope stat of the instrument today versus the S&P we can compute the difference and then we can express that as an average plus or minus one standard deviation plus or minus two or I'm sorry plus or minus one and I can tell you now how much better I can, t I can always tell you how much better the Russell has been over the last 30 days, but now with the alpha stat, we can tell you, is that an exceptionally large outperformance? So let's suppose that uh, the S&P was in an upturn and the Russell was a little bit better, so you increment it into the Russell, and it's now this far above, it's now this far above the S&P. Is that enough to be significant, and should I, st when do I start treating this as an exceptional gain and not just part of the normal oscillation between two instruments well when it gets above 1.0 on the alpha stat you now know that this thing has moved into exceptional territory and then when that collapses this rush back could be for, could be great and it may actually underperform because of short term momentum so the alpha stat is a way to measure on a statistically significant basis the relative performance of all the symbols that you are interested in compared to the S&P. So now the genius move is to say let me take 10 or 50 or 100 symbols and let me compute all of their alpha stat and then let me rank them on the basis of how well they are all performing compared to the S&P which is in the middle. And now I have a pool of maybe three or four or five symbols at the top that I especially want to look for long side and maybe three four or five at the bottom so that I can be short or I can start looking for the turn and see them marching their way back up the stack or watching these things when they start to fail watching them move back to the stack or I can watch them go up pull back and then resume and it almost is like buying a pocket on relative strength winners so the alpha stat is something that smokes out the asset allocation posture of large market participants in these big broad indexes with respect to the S&P and they cannot hide their relative postures over the last 30 days or the last 30 time periods. This is a very powerful idea.
and one that is expressed in the trade station bundle and uh, I'm uh, I'm building uh, a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet uh, which I have not distributed yet because I'm still working on the idea myself and um, yeah so that's that's the alpha step um, hopefully that answers briefly your question Jake okay yeah. okay um, No, it's not on the daily because this is a re I, this is an advanced technique that I use with pro money managers who have to have a lot of positions all the time and who are looking to refine um, their their positions among different asset classes. So, for example, you might buy you might have uh, uh, by the way your fund is constructed, you might have to have a minimum three percent position in twenty different asset classes and that you could grow them as high as 6%. So that means you would have 60% of your money is always locked in to those 20 asset classes. But you have 40% discretion. So how might you move that 40% around on a regular basis? Well, the alpha stat and the slope stat is a way that that can be done and allows you to almost use like hydraulics to move money back and forth between asset classes, okay? So that's really more of a swing strategy than a day trading strategy. But what I found is that extreme conditions of the alpha stat make something ripe for sharp reversals and is therefore useful uh, when it comes time to uh, picking day trading candidates. Um, those of you who are following the ox riders in the swing trading course, or look, uh, Mario has put together a little strategy where he's using uh, like the risk Z and he, found, he finds that it's really important to get those early days when things move from winter to spring or summer to fall, that getting those moves uh, is important. So the alpha stat and the slope stat are ways that you can be alerted to extreme conditions. In the same way that the, if you look at the Z-score, you know, the risk Z has that baked into the cake because it's already, it's already showing you how far risk Z has moved from the long-term average. So the same idea behind slope stat for the broad market. Now, if we just apply that to the other symbols, that's the basic idea. Okay. Uh, so that's that. So let me come back. Uh, I, I owed uh, Peter a quick look at his um, um, the um, where was it? Uh, he had some frog questions. He had a couple weeks ago. He uploaded some frogs. But I, I want to make sure, Peter, that you understood my position on the hybrid frog as a much better way uh, to get into um, frog trades. I think that's, to me, that's undisputable. But here's what I would say. All right, so on this particular uh, pattern, um, this big red box is the uh, frog box, and... Where the crosshairs are, that's the open. So this thing opened. Um, you can see that it moved uh, more than a frog box off the bottom. So if this was a leapfrog, by the way, you'd have gotten long here. If this was a hybrid frog, you'd have gotten long right about here and probably had a chance to cash a trade. Uh, and now... Um, Let me zoom this back a little bit so you can see. This line, if I can draw this a lot here. This line is one hour in. So I want you to notice when you look back, yep, there was the high of the day was formed in the first uh, in the first 60 minutes up in here. And now it's moved a frog box off the high. So at 60 minutes in, what I would have to do is this. I would have to have this up here, and I take this across, and I say now uh, down here, 
what's price actually doing? Well, it's actually going sideways. The first time that I get a, a two bar movement in my favor is over here. You notice that it's more than one frog box off the high and going down, but not two frog boxes. So I can actually get short right there. Now I can't get long because at this point, even though I have those two little green bars, I can't get long because the low of the day so far was right here. And it has not moved by this time. It has not moved uh, a frog box off the bottom. So in this case, uh, I'm right here. I can't get short until uh, right about till right about there. Then I'm short. Whoops. There we go. Now I can be short here, and uh, all the way down here we're short, and all we're doing is uh, is tracking the low of the day with this trailing stop and it never threatens that so that's how that works so that would be the um, uh, the, the slow frog right? so now let's take a look at the quick frog so the quick frog comes in instead of at 60 minutes he comes in at about 30 minutes so now when we take that at 30 minutes we see prices going up we say, oh, but from the low of the day, it has not made a frog box, so we can't get long. But when it rolls over here, and we have two uh, downward candles in a row, we can hang this sucker on there, and now we end up getting short. Here, instead of getting short where we were, were down here, and we save an extra probably 0.3 or 0.4 by getting short there. Uh, this is almost the same place we get short on the leapfrog, which got long and may have cashed a short win, and then stopped in reverse and got short here, and then it gets all of this particular move. Now, if we were in the hybrid frog, what I want to show you is I would take, um, let's see. Now I'm going to, in the hybrid frog, I'm going to take about 70% uh, just by eyeball. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, bracket the open in both directions. Okay? And so in this case, uh, we would have gotten long here. Uh, we'd have gotten long here, and at some point, when that uh, hybrid frog, um, we probably would have scratched that trade, and then the hybrid frog reversal ends up getting short right about here, which is better than this entry here, which is better than this entry down here. So the hybrid frog is not only simpler, it gets us in quicker, it lets us get to no lose plus dinner for two quicker, and is a preferred way to get in. So the last thing that I want to show you today, and, and thanks for hanging in there guys, you're doing a great job. Um, what I want to show you uh, is um, in the uh, videos, in the uh, video lessons, Uh, if you go to the 10 lessons, and I'm going to show you these videos in the day trading lesson first. Uh, at the top, under lesson zero, new bonus material where I had the introductions and the pinch and stretch and the river and the frog intro, uh, I've added 
these new videos. These were all taken from the live trading workshop. And these have to do with that new technique that we have been using in the chat room with much success. I mean with great success. The Four Seasons of MACD. An indicator that helps provide directional bias and fine-tuning of entries and exits. And these are insights and recordings made during the live trading workshop. And this applies to both day trading and swing trading because we actually did a hybrid of those. We were doing a lot of core and turbo. And so all of these videos are very, very powerful. And so I encourage you to look at them as soon as possible. I would look at those before I looked at any other lessons. And, and that way you'll be caught up to speed on our most current and advanced technique. So that's where it is in the advanced day trading workshop. Uh, for those of you listening on the swing trading workshop, Because these are so good, um, I included it in the um, swing trading workshop as well. So if you go to the right boards, and then go to the coursework, Again, the four seasons of MACD histogram, all those are placed in there as well. Now, uh, for those of you that might be interested in the videos of the uh, of all the live trading, um, uh, these are the recaps and some of the uh, some of the key moments of those. But we've got an awful lot more videos that were generated during the live trading. I mean, where we went in the actual moment of making the trades. Uh, all of that stuff is recorded in high def, and uh, we're processing the videos now. We're going to make that. That's the home study course. The research weekend had a dozen presentations that were amazing on both day trading and swing trading. And then the live trading workshop is probably going to have, you know, 50 to 100 separate videos on different case studies. Uh, and uh, that's the closest you can get to live trading with me. If you're not there in the room, I mean, it was uh, it was stream of consciousness, warts and all. Um, you hear us and see us framing the trade on the great big screen, uh, answering questions, looking at a lot of different ideas. Um, I'm going to extend the uh, sale price on that for another uh, another, I think, a couple weeks, just because I I mean it was so good. I think people ought to have it at a discount. So uh, these will get you started, though, and if you find yourself interested in these and want more, then the thing to do would be to get the uh, the uh, day trading workshop or the uh, yeah the live trading workshop videos. We deliver those through Dropbox. Uh, so that's kind of the deal. All right, uh, you'll see uh, all, uh, hybrid frogs being done every day. You'll see owl patterns. You'll see collapsing dragons, emerging dragons. Continuation patterns, um, the RLFF, you'll see Z3 pinches, everything that's in the repertoire, um, you will see us doing. Okay, so that's what that is. All right, that's everything that I got, um, uh, Peter. The uh, I, I hopefully that was that was sufficient. Um, it's getting a little late. We're already two hours into this thing. Um, if you need me to go through those other uh, uh, screenshots you gave me. I can do that, but hopefully you have enough to think about. I really want you concentrating on the um, hybrid frog discussion that I had, though. Okay. Uh, so that's everything I got, guys. Um, uh, take good care, and uh, we will see you in the chat room.